And over Cash Sky in downtown Minneapolis, where we will play baseball tonight at Target Field, the first of a three-game series with the Tigers. We welcome you to Twins Baseball on Fox Sports North. The Twins lost their first seven games to the Tigers this season, but tonight look for their third consecutive win against Detroit. Let's set up this series with the Tigers, who have been in a bit of a free fall over the last two weeks. Their offense has been in trouble. It's cost them five and a half games to Cleveland in that span. This series important in their playoff chase. Detroit 20 and 27 against other AL Central opponents. Detroit's offense came alive Sunday courtesy of Justin Upton who launched a pair of three run homers 880 feet in total against Boston. Meanwhile the Twins offense went ice cold in Kansas City the lowest batting average in Major League Baseball the last four games just six runs in that four game series against Kansas City. Dick Bramer Jack Morris turned their attention to the challenge that lies ahead tonight for Kyle Gibson looks to build on his last start here tonight. Sports North is presented by Menards. Save big money at Menards on all your home improvement needs. By Dodge. Find your summer of performance with great deals at the Dodge Summer Clearance event. And by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine for the everyday competitor in all of us. It is just a three game homestand for the Twins tonight. The first of three between the Twins and the Detroit Tigers who are on the fringes of a pennant race they will need Anibal Sanchez to be as good as he was his last time out if they're going to get into postseason play this year. Similarly the Twins are hoping that what they saw from Kyle Gibson in his last start is a sign of things to come. He's been either really really good again this year or really really bad. And we welcome you to Target Field so far the rain has held off Dick Bramer along with Jack Morris for the opening game of this three game series. Kyle Gibson pitched a complete game win his last time out against the Braves and the Twins are hoping crossing their fingers doing whatever they can to 
hope that he's got more games like that in his future. Yeah, it had to be a confidence builder for Kyle. He went out there and threw his first complete game at the big league level. And whether it's the Atlanta Braves in last place or the team in front of him, the Detroit Tigers tonight, you still have to beat the team that you're facing. He did a good job of that his last time out. And he did it by pitching ahead and counts. He had a very good pitch count. He needs to try to do that tonight. Get deeper into the game because he doesn't throw a lot of pitches. Keep the ball down in the zone. That's when he is at his best. I think it's fair to say that the deepest position in the American League is second base and we've got two of the league's best squaring off against one another here in this series Ian Kinsler for the Tigers and Brian Dozier for the Twins. Establish that fastball. Got him to chase a high fastball. And strike it. Blue with the catch. Relay to first double play. Strike three. Struck out the side. Kyle Gibson taking the mound, hoping to repeat his performance against the Braves. He'll be making his first start of this year against the Detroit Tigers. He's had a pretty good uh, pretty good numbers against Detroit recently is uh, scouting report for tonight. He needs to throw his fastball in keep it down but throw it in. He occasionally should throw an off speed breaking ball to start a hitter. A lot of times they'll sit on that one that if he makes a mistake they'll jump over that fastball and keep it down. Kyle has more success when he's down in the zone than when he's up in the zone. Brad Osmus has his team above the 500 mark by six games but they're seven and a half games behind Cleveland because they haven't been able to beat Cleveland and uh, they think they have a chance with the next week and a half schedule ahead of them that uh, they can uh, pick up some ground uh, both in the wild card and the division leaders the Menards batting order for the Tigers Ian Kinsler newly acquired Eric Ibar Miguel Cabrera Victor Martinez J.D. Martinez Justin Upton Casey McGee James McCann and Cameron Mabin. And they'll be facing right hander Kyle Gibson coming off a good start his last time his first complete game making his 18th start and there's the numbers for Kyle this year. Northland for defense for the twins Danny Santana getting another start in left field Eddie Rosario in center Max Kepler in right. Bluff Polanco left side of the infield Dozier Mauer right side of the infield Juan Centeno caught Gibson's jam in Atlanta and he'll make the Starting assignment behind the plate tonight. Jack, you mentioned that for Gibson, it might be a good idea to mix in an off-speed pitch uh, as the first pitch to a batter 
I would think this would be one of the candidates to uh, maybe want to do that against because Ian Kinsler loves to pounce on that first pitch fastball. Yeah, he's good at that. He loves the ball down in the zone, so he is one guy you want to try to get in on him. But I think Kyle in general uh, throws too many fastballs first pitch, and uh, when you get predictable, hitters know that. There's a good fastball down and away, strike one. Kinsler, Ibar, and Cabrera. Missing inside one and one. Let's see where the shortstop Polanco is almost lined up behind Ploof in the outfield grass. Yeah, that's a real pull on that side of the infield. Inside two and one. Mention the Tigers schedule. They have three here in Minnesota. Then they have three with the Angels, three with the White Sox, three teams that are already looking forward to next year. So this is a critical week and a half for the Tigers if they want to make up some ground. Two and one. Driven to right field and hit well. Kepler going back on the track. Leaps and makes the catch one away. A lineup for the first out of the first inning. Kepler back in the lineup after getting a couple of starts off. We'll bring we, up Eric Ibar. We talk about it all the time, the importance of pitching and how the twins need to get better in that department. Well, the Tigers with Manny Ball Sanchez on the mound tonight. Here's a guy with experience who knows how to pitch. He has had a tough, tough, tough go of it this year. It has been better as of late, but Verlander's been get better. They've got Michael Fulmer's dealing really for the most part this year. And if they can get a healthy Zimmerman back, uh, they've got the tools maybe to get a little bit closer to Cleveland. There's Fulmer. And strike two. Yeah, if you want to break the components of a baseball team into per, uh, the performance of a baseball team into three components, two strikes here to Ibar, newly acquired from the Braves about a week ago. Fouled back. And you wanted to just break it down simply, too simply, but hitting, pitching, and fielding. The Twins lineup is what, seven runs behind the Tigers, same number of games. Sure. Uh, nine runs less than the Tigers. So that's pretty much a wash, but the Tigers. Are a far superior team in the pitching department and in the fielding department. And this one hooked down the line, foul. It's funny we're seeing Eric Ibar play in here tonight. He was scheduled to play for the Braves, and all of a sudden, scratch from the lineup and sent to Detroit. Tigers needing a, a veteran presence on the left side of the infield. It's short with Iglesias hurt. So Kyle Gibson, even though he was supposed to pitch against him in his last start. We'll pitch against him here tonight. Missed inside one and two. Ibar's season this year with the Braves, one of uh, two different seasons. First 10 weeks or so really struggled and then performed like the Eric Ibar we've grown accustomed to seeing with the Angels the last few weeks before the trade. And now two and two. Well, that pitch right there, a little bit lower than the one before it. But the one before it is a typical Kyle Gibson pitch. It is so close to being a borderline strike. But yet off the plate, and for whatever reason, Kyle's one of those guys that rarely gets the hitter to go after it. Grounded weakly to second. Dozier's there. The Mauer two down. Tonight's cold hard facts brought to you by Clean Crisp Coors Light. And Kyle Gibson, one of those pitchers, and we've seen a lot of them over the years, that seems to have a terrible time getting through the first inning. 11 pitches so far. That's a pretty good start. If you can. Get an out here recorded within the next four or five pitches. I would consider that a fairly good inning. Two down, base is empty for Miguel Cabrera. There's Neil Allen, the pitching coach for the Twins. On the outside corner. You've heard Bert talk about it a lot when it comes to Kyle Gibson and the fact that they're really looking for more consistency from him. He's just been back and forth, up and down. In his entire career, as far as good games, not so good games, and trying to find a little bit of rhythm. Maybe he can get on a little roll at the end of this year and go into spring training in the offseason, knowing that it's within him to rattle off five to ten straight quality starts. Oh, and two to Cabrera. Just missed the corner. And we've seen. Extended periods of time for Gibson where he's 
whole month or so at a time where he's really pitched well start after start after start but he has not done that so far this year and more often than not a good one is followed by a bad one and now two and two I just think he's kind of getting into midseason form he was on the DL to start the year and uh, for quite a while and I think it takes a pitcher some time to pitch in the heat of the summer and get those innings built up where you feel strong Get a rhythm going. Two and two. Got him. Shaved the corner. Cabrera doesn't like it. But he strikes out to end the first inning, and Gibson goes through the first one, two, three. Well, they got away with one there. The city in a very disappointing weekend for Paul Molitor. Who saw his team win the two games in Atlanta. And for whatever reason, the Twins are having a terrible time with the Kansas City Royals this year. They lost all four games. They'll try to end that losing streak with this Menard's batting order. Brian Dozier will lead things off. Jorge Polanco batting second to Joe Maurer. Trevor Plouffe, Max Kepler, Miguel Sano, Eddie Rosario, Juan Centeno, and Danny Santana. They're going to be facing the right hander, Anibal Sanchez. He's uh, appeared in 29 games this year. He's been in and out of the bullpen. He really struggled early in the year, but coming off a really good start his last time out in Kansas City. Since he's returned to the rotation, he's had uh, a great deal of difficulty on the road. And his four starts since being put back into the rotation, it's only lasted 18 and a third innings, and he's given up 24 earned runs. There's a pop up. And Kinsler near second base. Waits and makes the catch one away. And that'll bring up Polanco. Northland four defense for the Tigers. We mentioned they statistically are a much better defensive team than the Twins. They've got a veteran in left, a veteran in center, J.D. Martinez in right. McGee at third base for an injured Castellanos. Ibar for an injured Iglesias. Kinsler and Cabrera on the right side, and James McCann back behind the plate. Yeah, if you're going to hit it anywhere right now against Detroit, you want to hit it to the left side of the infield. Ibar is fresh, even though he's been around for a while. McGee's relatively new, and the guy in left field, Upton, he can be a liability at times. One strike to Polanco. Zipped inside, one and one. The story with Sanchez is really the story of a lot of pitchers. He lost his command and was really struggling to get ahead of hitters, falling behind, and then making, having to throw strikes when he's behind in counts. Everything was just hittable. And uh, he's a guy that's always been one of those guys that wants to get you to swing out of the zone. If he can get ahead, then he gets a lot of movement to both sides of the plate and has really good good success. Of, of getting hitters to swing out of the zone. Three and one, Mauer on deck. Yeah, 
drive to center and made it back still going back and he makes the catch on the edge of the track. A drilled a drive off the bat of Polanco for out number two to bring up Mauer. Let's look at Anibal Sanchez's last start it was in Kansas or in Detroit against the Royals. And he was dealing he had a no hitter for six and two thirds of an inning. Came out of the game with a win and then the bullpen coughed it up he got a no decision. But a very good outing his last time out. Two down and now Bauer. Like rain falling here at Target Field. Up on away ball one. Bauer did not have a good road trip through Atlanta and Kansas City. Unusual for Joe to not hit well at Kauffman Stadium. Two and oh. Average down to 276. Did hit his 10th home run of the year on the road trip. Takes a strike. Ah. Two and one. An interesting road trip for Joe. He, he did extremely well down in Atlanta. And then a tough series where he hits really well in his career in Kansas City. He just had a, a tough run there. He did have an off day where he didn't play. Out in front, two and two. The Twins ran into a team playing its best baseball of the season and a pitching rotation that is pitching its best ball of the season so far. Two and two. Yeah, they ran Kansas City. They ran through these Tigers the series before that. Justin Verlander yeah. was on a personal roll and he lost a game in Kansas City. Royals swept the Tigers. Now three and two to Bauer with Plouffe on deck. Twins won't see Justin Verlander or Michael Fulmer in this three game series. Twins will face Boyd and Norris a couple of left handers. In games two and three. That's Fulmer we just saw Verlander and Norris. And that old guy there I think he's called the manager. Brad Osmus. Full count and a ball laced to center field. Good at bat for Maurer. And the Twins making some solid contact here in the last two at bats. Polanco lined out. Maurer with a sharp single, and that'll bring up Plouffe. First hit of the game going to Joe Maurer. The ball that he was patient enough to get up over the plate. We'll see it again. You can see how it's left up over the plate, outer half. And Joe going with the pitch. Classic Joe Maurer swing, lining it right back up the middle. And now Plouffe, a couple of doubles Sunday against Danny Duffy. And Trevor had a pretty good series down in Kansas City. Had a couple multi-hit games. Popped up. And Kinsler coming back onto the infield dirt. Ends the inning. Leave Mauro aboard. No score after one.
field for the Twins and Kyle Gibson against the Tigers. Gibson is coming off that nine inning complete game that he threw last week Wednesday in Atlanta and Juan Centeno was behind the plate in that game and Juan today told me that he and Gibson were really on the same page and really in a good rhythm and that they even talked about it on Sunday afternoon in Kansas City just how well they felt like they were on the same page and Centeno said he feels like it's good for him to catch a guy in back to back starts especially coming off of a really good start because he feels like that kind of carries over and he really knows a little bit better what a pitcher is looking for and Jack I would imagine you've been part of this good chemistry between pitcher and catcher and I'm wondering how well that can carry over especially coming off something like a complete game. Well, thanks Marnie I definitely would agree with that you know you come off a good outing you can't wait to get out there again. And you won't see Victor yeah. Martinez get <laughs> too many infield too hits. First hit of the game is a seven hopper put in the perfect spot and Martinez hobbles limps back to first base. That'll go down for the first hit off of Kyle Gibson you can see Polanco the lone soldier on the left side there and that ball gets by him so third baseman Trevor Poop has to come all the way over to the normal shortstop spot to field that ball. Victor can't run any faster than that. That's his best effort right there. And it was just good enough to get a first hit. I wonder if he's going to be okay. He's kind of grimacing over there like he might have pulled a muscle. Well, his speed or lack of it might be a factor here in the second inning. If J.D. Martinez does what he has done so often since he came off the disabled list, hits it over the fence, it won't matter. He has really sparked this Tiger lineup. Big swing and a miss. Follow up on Marnie's point with Kyle Gibson and Juan Centeno. You know, whenever you have a good outing, you, you can't wait to get back out there. And, and when you literally feel like your catcher and yourself are on the same page, it, it gives confidence knowing that All right, I can trust this guy. I've just got to hit his glove. That's what a catcher always preaches to the pitcher. Just hit my glove. We'll get through this. No, in your years with Detroit, Lance Parrish was your guy most of the time. Yep. But I would imagine every once in a while, Mike Heath or somebody else would would catch you, right? Well, Mike came in after Lance was a free agent, went over to Philadelphia. So yeah, yeah. I had Mike all year long. But we had a couple other guys that were the backup catchers to Lance. And of course, Lance was. Kind of a rarity. He caught 150 plus games right. in the year. So most of my starts while I was a member of Detroit, Lance Parrish was behind the plate. I relied on him tremendously. I not so much in selection of pitches, but uh, trusting that he would block balls in the dirt. I could throw my fork ball down the zone, not even worry about it getting by him. And it builds confidence. It gives you a lot of confidence that you're going to be able to just execute your pitches. Catcher will take care of the running game. I wasn't very good at that when I was young because I had Lance. He had a rocket. Two and two to JD Martinez. Now Centeno sets up away. Check swing. Did he go? Strike three. Oh boy. On a check swing, Martinez and his dangerous bat. Head back to the dugout. Well, that was a very good pitch right there for Kyle Gibson. Ball was down and away off the plate. And we're going to see the side swing there, and certainly he did go. J.D. Martinez had that bat head go through the strike zone. So first base umpire C.B. Buckner called the right, made the right call. One down, and now Justin Upton. Upton with a big game on Sunday, a couple of three-run home runs. And then a drive to the wall at Comerica Park, which is only 420 feet from home plate. Tigers knew what they were getting when they signed Justin Upton. Here's a guy that's a very streaky hitter. He will go through what Tiger fans just didn't even want to witness the first month and a half of the season. It seemed like every at bat was a pathetic swing and then a strikeout. And then he gets red hot and he can literally drive in 25 runs in a week. And he had a great series, a great game just the other day. 442 at bats, 143 strikeouts. Gibson falls behind him 2 0. Missing in 
side again. Brad Osmus gave him a couple of mental health days, and it got a lot of publicity because Upton's a veteran. Paul Molitor gave Max Kepler a couple of days off, and it didn't get the publicity. But <laughs> both hitters in each case were struggling. Yeah, you don't get those when you're swinging the bat well. <laughs> no mental health days. Drill to the corner and fair. Now Martinez can't run very well. He'll get second base. He'll try for third. Here's the throw. Not in time. It's a double for Upton. Another extra base hit. Second and third, one away. Kyle left that one over the plate a little bit. The previous pitch had tremendous movement. A ball that ended up inside. And then this one, we'll watch it. You can see how straight it was. Stayed right up the inner third of the plate. And Upton, that's kind of right in his sweet swinging zone right there. Because of Sunday, given the green light to swing away there, and he drives Martinez to third base. That's not a foregone conclusion. Second and third, one down, and now Casey McGee. And Castellanos hurt. They hope to get him back in the middle of September. And Gibson misses inside to McGee. Seems to be where Gibson uh, is trying to attack these Tiger hitters inside off the plate. It's a good game plan. It really is. You don't want all these guys to extend their arms. If you can get that ball in the inner half, I think that's exactly where you want to pitch the Tigers. On the ground, no chance for Martinez to score, and Polanco flips to first. Twins were playing the infield in only as far as they needed to with the slow running Martinez at third base. And now with 20, two outs, they'll play straight up. Polanco and Dozier will go back to their normal depth. James McCann, the batter, eventually, he's stuck in the on deck circle right now. Anyway, I was about to say with McGee, just like the Tigers missing JD Martinez, they really missed Nick Castellanos. He was having his best year ever in the big leagues offensively. And that's the name of the game, you know, try to stay healthy. Every team seems to go through periods where they lose a key player. The Tigers trying to stay in the race with Cleveland, and they're still not clicking on all eight. Down and away ball one. 30 pitches for Gibson, only 17 strikes. There's Nick Castellanos. See his left hand all wrapped up. One and oh to McCann. Gibson falls behind two and oh. James McGann has kind of quietly emerged as the team leader as far as clubhouse thinks. He's maybe going to be an everyday catcher. Jared Salta Lamaki is his backup this year. Of course, Salty is a left a switch hitter, so he's playing occasionally. Offensively, McCann just still hasn't really gotten to the point. He had a leg injury and uh, like Victor Martinez, who had a leg and knee injury, hard to push off when your back foot is still hurting you. 3 0 to McCann. It was 3 0 to Upton, Upton when he whistled a double. But McCann's only hitting 211. And the number nine batter, Maben, is on deck. And Kyle needs an out right here. Pitch count. Not exactly where it was against Atlanta. Already 32 pitches here, and he's not out of the second inning yet. So you kind of got to keep an eye on that with him. A four-pitch walk. The light hitting James McCann. And they're loaded up now for Maven. Here's how Castellanos got hurt. And that will hurt. Got hit right on the back side of the hand. Not a lot has gone right for the Tigers. As you see uh, Castellanos wrapping the wrist in the hand, rewrapping it. One of the things that has gone right is reacquiring Cameron Maben. Now he's had a thumb injury and has just recently uh, rejoined the lineup. But look at the numbers 323. Crazy numbers at home at American yeah. Park in Detroit. Gibson misses again, 1 0. 
but he's definitely short up center field. Jack swing two and oh. Gibson having a terrible time throwing strikes here. He has yet to give up a run, but his strike percentage has taken a big hit here. Throwing fewer strikes than ball. Yeah, that's never good. Kyle tends to be a little too fine at times. He always wants to put the ball on the black. And you know, it's it's fine and dandy to miss off the plate, which he does a lot. Those are accounting for most of his balls. But he needs to attack the zone better than he does. And be able to come back on hitters when he falls behind. Two and oh. Fall back. And the control issues this inning started in the Upton event. Martinez dribbled a single near the second base bag. Martinez struck out quickly, then it was 3 0 to Upton. Double, and then McGee was out quickly, and then a four pitch walk to McCann. Gibson trying to leave the bases full in the second. Yeah, On the outside corner. Very close pitch, and in this situation, what a difference. It's not 3 and 1, it's 2 and 2. Well, it throws a slider here. And uh, you be the judge. I won't even call that a strike because I don't see the line touching the line. Now, if I was pitching, that's a strike all day long. <laughs> two and two to Maven. Now, three and two, and everybody will get started early. I'd rather see Kyle throw that breaking ball right there than up and away. Or off the plate away. At least when it's over the heart of the plate down, a hitter is tempted to take a swing at it. He's going to have to throw a strike here. Full count with the bases full and two down. Wow. A base is loaded walk to the number nine batter. Back to back walks. And the Tigers get a run in. It's just another one of those borderline pitches for Kyle. It's just so typical of how he goes about it. You know, instead of maybe trying to be perfect on the corner, just hitting a third of the plate, either in or away, and making sure the ball crosses the plate in those situations. You can't afford a walk there. And I know it's easier said than done. Certainly, I've walked in hitters. Every pitcher that's around for a while is going to do it, but. Needs to come back now on a very good hitter, Ian Kinsler. Third on the team in runs batted in, and now a breaking ball off the plate. Yeah, this is a an RBI man hitting out of the leadoff spot. Hit the ball hard his first time up to Kepler on the warning track in right. One and oh. High fly, left field. Santana. Near the stands, makes the catch, a foul ball catch to end the inning. And Gibson escapes a shaky second inning with just one run allowed.
Cardinals one to nothing. Time for tonight's Honda Power Sports Power Stat. Both teams on pace to have one of the highest home run totals in their respective team history. Tigers' rate of 1.31 home runs per game would be the fourth highest in their long history, and the Twins would be the fifth highest in their team history. There's Max Kepler. He's at 15 of them, showing bunt and taking ball one. But again, in the overall stats, the idea is to score runs, and there's only nine runs now, 10 runs difference between the Tiger lineup and the Twins lineup with the same number of games played. Kepler takes a strike at the knees, one and one. Well, in the history of the game, both franchises have been around for a while. It's not like they're expansion teams. And the one good thing is we can just throw away that whole concept of target field to pitcher's ballpark. His balls are shown now to go out of this ballpark. You hit them right, they're going to go. I think it's a fair ballpark. Now that the concrete's dried and all the <laughs> controversy is behind us. To left center field. That's down for a hit. Might run the gap. Cutting it off is Upton. And Kepler will be held to a long single. The Twins got a two out single in the first. Now a leadoff single by Kepler. We've got a couple of days out of the starting lineup in Kansas City and then the off day yesterday. And comes back to the lineup with a single. Yeah, mentally refreshed. Uh, they're going to pitch him down there now. This, I think the league is starting to realize that Max Kepler likes the ball down and in. And he can handle the ball anywhere on the inner half. And so he's been seeing a lot of pitches away, but a great job of keeping his head on the ball, going out after that ball, just going with it. He didn't try to pull it. He was able to shoot it the other way. Get it back. Miguel Sano takes up high, ball one. Sano figures has spent most of his career hitting third or fourth in the Twins lineup, but he's been struggling, so as the designated hitter, he will hit sixth here tonight. As Paul Molitor today about Sano and the chances of him getting back to third base. And he said, yeah, maybe as soon as tomorrow. The Twins wanted to see him go through a day of throwing across the diamond. Paul was watching Sano's throws during batting practice today and will make an assessment. Sano might be the third baseman tomorrow. 2 and 0. And a strike on the outside corner. Now he's been in a little bit of a funk offensively. And he needs to maybe figure out something. I don't think he's seeing the ball all that well. It's nice to watch him just take a few strikes and track the ball because he's been he's been committing real early in a lot of his swings on pitches that are out of the zone. That would explain a lot of the check swings too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to get beat. You know, Cardinal Sin and as far as hitters is getting beat with fastball, being tardy on the swing. So especially if you're a big strong guy like Sano, oh, you never want to get beat. You tend to start it early. High fastball gets a swing in a minute. Yeah, he got beat right there. At 91 miles per hour. About something off of you and um, it's a theory that Sano will realize his potential when he gets to where JD Martinez is the acknowledgement the realization that he can hit the ball almost as far to the opposite field as he can to the pull side. He didn't necessarily agree but you know, I think Sano is someone who if he doesn't know it should realize very quickly that 380 feet to right field counts just as much as 440 feet to left field. His manager has come out and said he doesn't need to. Oh, wait swing. a second. What's going on here? A balk. Sanchez apparently called for a balk. And Kepler will go to second base. Well, it must have been Jim Reynolds, the second base umpire, who called it. And I'm guessing they said he did not come to a complete stop. And that's what they're saying. He did not pause in the set position. I don't agree with that at all. But you talk to a guy that during the balk here led the world. That was 1988. The reason, that, the reason the rule was because the guy who normally sits in that chair. <laughs> Three and two. And me. The balk is all about deceiving the hitter. We were not trying to deceive the hitter. We're trying to get him out. <laughs> But through deception. No, right? not through deception no. at all. Full count to Sano with Kepler at second. 
A very high pop up. McCann comes back for a look, but it's out of play. Back to your conversation about Miguel Sano. I, there's no question that he possesses some of the most broad power of any hitter that I've seen in a long, long time. And therefore, you know, his manager said he does not need to hit swing like he's trying to hit home runs to hit home runs. Heck, he's a guy that probably can have a check swing and hit home runs. A lot like that guy you just saw, Miguel Cabrera. Right. But Cabrera too, you know, he can hit him out in the plaza yep. up here to right field, and we but just haven't seen Sano do much of that. To your point, Dick, Cabrera has learned that he doesn't have to swing hard. He's so strong right. that he'll shoot the ball the other way and go opposite field home run in the gap in the alley, anywhere in the ballpark. And I think I think Miguel Sano has the same potential with his power as Miguel Cabrera. Full count. Bouncer to short. Kepler's going to try to advance, and he'll get there. And Ibar throws him out. So I guess a good move by Kepler, but it sure didn't look good at the start. A slow hopper to Ibar, and Kepler moves to third. Well, this is one of those plays where if it's hit in front of you, you better get there because you don't want to be thrown out of third base. But Ibar makes the decision to go to first, and Kepler now 90 feet away from tying the game. Now Rosario and the Tigers will play the infield back up the middle and even Cabrera backing up at first base. McGee a step or two in front of the bag at third so the Tigers are conceding a run here if it's hit on the ground past the pitcher. Strike one. I guess if you're Anibal Sanchez you'd rather see Rosario up right now than some of the other players for the Twins because he's a free swinger. He'll chase. Popped up behind third, and McGee's going to have a play, perhaps. And no, it's out of play. A bit of breeze blowing in from the right field plaza area, and that may have helped push that ball out of play. Now it's 0-2 to Rosario. Well, this is how Sanchez has made his living: to get ahead and then. Have the ability to have hitters chase out of the zone. He's got a ball that he can run away from a left-hander slider that'll run in. Not Jam in. shot. And Ibar calls and catches two down. And that'll leave it up to Santana. So the Tigers were willing to give the Twins the tying run, but Rosario just popped up weakly. Centeno will try to get Kepler in for third. Good pitch right there from Sanchez. He was able to tail that little cutter in on the hands of Rosario. We talk about pitching in. Those are the kind of pitches we talk about. Just not being able to put the good part of the bat on the ball. And Centeno takes down and away. Ball one. Tigers a run on a bases loaded walk. Trying to get it back with a two out hit from Centeno. Behind him, Danny Santana. Roller to the right side. Kensler has an easy play. Kepler left at third, and the Tigers have a 1 0 lead.
third inning. And Gibson had a rough second inning, hoping for a better time of it in the third. He'll face Ibar, Cabrera, and Victor Martinez. Tigers with an outside chance of catching, passing the Cleveland Indians, but they played the Indians 12 times and beat them just once. It's funny. I, I still don't get how that happens. So the Tigers, who have beaten up on the Twins at least early in the year, can't beat the team that the Twins have beaten up on. Yeah. <laughs> Eight out of 13 times. Hooked on a line to Mauer one away. The Tigers are uh, looking up at the Indians because they haven't been able to beat them but everybody else they've done OK with the exception of the Royals and I guess you look at what the Royals have done against the Twins and a couple of other teams in the division to see where the Tigers are and why they are where they are and it, to me it underscores the importance of these divisional games and the Twins have struggled generally but in particular they've struggled against everybody except Cleveland and that's why they are where they are. Well, we mentioned earlier that Kansas City swept Detroit previous to the Twins coming in. And they're red hot right now. And kind of creeping closer and closer to Detroit. I think you become more aware of it when you're in the bottom couple spots of a division as the Twins have been for most of the last six years. One and one. It's one and a half swing strike two. You know, when the Twins are winning divisions regularly, they always dominated everybody in the division and it just seemed like another game. But <laughs> when you're the team getting beat within your division it, uh, the hurt the pain seems greater than the joy of winning those games on the ground sharply a base hit and Cabrera's aboard with a one out single takes a big turn but will hold up. September 20th is Ryder Cup night at Target Field. A limited number of Ryder Cup theme night ticket packages are available that include a game ticket and Ryder Cup themed Twins cap. Learn more at twinsbaseball.com slash Ryder Cup. Call 833 Twins. It was a year ago that they brought the Ryder Cup into the Twins uh, dugout. I was so. going to say, now that pitcher, don't don't be confused. Joe Mauer's never been on a Ryder Cup champion. No, team. no. But he, see, they entrusted him to hold the trophy. And when that picture was taken, well, is that, I, is I was that as precious as that crazy hockey thing. The, you Stanley, know, the Stanley Cup, Cup? thing. But see, I've, I've actually Lord touched. Stanley, yeah, I've it, touched the Stanley sacred? Cup. Is that sacred to you? Uh, it was kind of cool to touch it. It was. <laughs> but they wouldn't let me anywhere near. It's a piece near. of metal with yeah, the bow of names on it. It's history, Jack. It's, it's you know, symbolic. So why, do you, why is it a big deal to touch it, though? I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed touching the Stanley Cup. <laughs> and you aren't alone. There's a bunch of I people that. that think that's the coolest thing in the world. But they I'm would. just wondering if the Ryder Cup has any of that momentum going towards maybe someday being as right. prestigious right. As, as the Stanley Cup. Well, they wouldn't let me anywhere near the Ryder Cup. <laughs> I didn't know the right people. I said, I know Jack Morris. I work with well, Jack Morris. Well, you want to know what it got me? Jack could care less about a silly trophy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not. You know, now don't say that. I mean, we. Oh, I know. I but, probably offended somebody. Well, no, the 91 World Series trophy. Doesn't that mean something to you? The trophy itself doesn't. Really? No, the, the memory of it okay. means a lot. All right. It's, I've always said that man can make a lot of cool things. Right. But memories are yeah. more important. Two and one to Victor Martinez. Grounded foul. Now, no, that brings a point. Do you, do you ever wear your World Series ring? Rarely. Rarely, I should wear it more than I do. I know a lot of fans have asked me about it. Why don't you wear right. it? I'll be honest with you, it's 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 big, cumbersome, and uh, I just like the freedom. I'm not I right. work with my hands a lot. I think I showed my son. I had 16 cuts in my hand from cleaning an old greasy old grill <laughs> that had all sorts of sharp corners, but it's clean now. Two and two to Victor Martinez. Gibson looking for a double play grounder. Instead of pop up near third, and Polanco trying to track it in the twilight. That's not easy. You wonder if the lights might have got in his eyes a little bit there. The wind isn't a huge factor right now, I don't think. But maybe it is the sky and the lighting. 
Two down, and now J.D. Martinez. Either case, he did a nice job of staying with it, getting it out there. And he was the only infielder on that side of the infield. J.D. Martinez struck out on a check swing in the second inning. Down and away, ball one. Been a struggle for Gibson. 53 pitches, 27 strikes. And the Tiger run scoring on a bases loaded walk. Not inside, and Martinez is able to push it foul. That's where you have to pitch JD. You get the ball out away from him where he can extend those arms. He has the perfect swing, kind of an uppercut swing, to drive the ball down and in, down and away, down and, or up and away. Anything away, he can really put a nice swing on it. I've seen Centeno during the Martinez at bats work both extremes just off the outside corner, just off the inside corner. Now missing inside. And that's exactly my point. I was talking to a group of Twins fans here tonight for the game. And one of the questions I was asked is about, you know, do you have a different philosophy than Bert as far as what pitch to throw? And I said, well, I kind of do, but I'll explain why I do. And now missing outside. Three and one. You've heard your partner talk many, many times about down and away, down and away. Got to throw down and away. Well, I think what Bert fails to tell the fans is that in his generation, he pitched in a lot. And so that ball down and away, they didn't have the kind of swings that this guy at the plate right now will have on a ball down and away. When you keep a guy on us inside, you're not going to get a very good swing down and away. But my, my favorite pitch of all time was on the hands, below the hands, inside. Because very few guys can do anything with the ball underneath their hands above the knee but underneath their hands on the inner half if they hit it hard it's usually going to be fall because the bat head has to be through the zone in order to meet it out in front of the plate right so it's a it's a general disagreement in philosophy but I think we're really speaking the same language because Bert's pitch down and away is very successful when you establish him and as a observer of uh, what I've seen here for the last five six years I think in each theory, if you throw it down the middle, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> well, you know what? Unless you're pitching to Kirby Puckett, <laughs> because you could throw it from his shoe tops to his neck, and he would swing and probably square it up as good as anybody. But you throw it down the middle, you, he, he wasn't ready for that one. Full count here with two gone, and Cabrera still at first base. Gibson spent a lot of time here, last couple innings, pitching from the stretch. Cabrera will leave. Now. Swing and a miss. Good pitch. Martinez strikes out for the second time against Gibson and still one nothing.
Sports North is presented by CenturyLink. Switch to CenturyLink Prism TV for an advanced TV experience. Learn more at cprismtv.com. Well, a hint of a rainbow. It's not quite the double rainbow we had during the home run derby when the All-Star game was played here, but we'll take that as a sign that we might uh, be dry for the rest of the night. Here's Danny Santana, and there's a bunt. Sanchez has an easy play on the way. The idea, a yeah. good one, but the execution not the best. Right, he needed to pull that ball a little better. One pitch, one out. Tonight's Toyota Key stat. And Mike Trout on the top of the list in terms of runs scored since 2014. Brian Dozier there as well. Dozier 28 times has gotten both a run scored and an RBI with the 28 home runs. It's kind of amazing to me how close Dozier and Kinsler are in that department. There's a chance that Dozier could get to 100 runs scored again this year. He's got 75 on the season. We got 38 games left. Strike two. Dozier popped up to Kinsler's first time up. Just two for 24 against Annabel Sanchez. Hitting particularly well here at home since the All Star break. Tapper in front of McGee. Dozier hustling. McGee bare hands, and Dozier beats it out. A little 60 foot nubber, and Dozier's aboard with a one out hit. I don't even know how Brian Dozier hit that pitch. Sanchez and McCann saw McCann give a high target. He went up in the zone. The ball was up. And Doge is able to top the ball. So let's watch it again. The point of contact for Brian Dozier. <laughs> how does that? How, how do you get on top of yeah, the ball? How do you hit that on the ground? <laughs> but he topped it and ended up with a base hit. So now Dozier at first and Polanco at the plate. Got a line drive bullet to center field and even tracked it down on the track. Dozier with nine steals on the year and 11 tries. He's with a very good stolen base percentage team wise, but of course, a lot of those were taken to San Francisco when Nunez got traded. On the year, the Twins 78 for 102 in stolen base attempts. And that 82% is outstanding. Up, ball one. Now McCann, the catcher, has got a very strong arm. Yeah, he really does. He's got a great release and a very accurate throwing arm. To top it off with a strong arm. But wouldn't you guess that Paul Mulder, a manager, would be trying to instill in young players the running game, and the art of it, and knowing when to go? That you can even. Grab bags off some of the best catchers in the league. Well, celebrated a big birthday yesterday. Big for some people. For us guys, it's just another day. But you're in the club, aren't you? I am in that club. Yeah. Yeah, I am too. I, I, I don't. Not bashful to admit, I'm a little bit older than Paul. Over the inside corner, I am by a few months. Me too, just a few more months. <laughs> Two and one to Polanco. He's trying to get the game tied up. He got a leadoff single in the second and pushed Kepler over to third base, but he was left there. Got there with one out. Twins didn't get him in. There goes Dozier, and the pitch swung on and missed. And Dozier has a steal of second base. Head first slide. He was able to keep that left hand on the bag. Well, that was all on Brian Dozier and his jump off of Annabelle Sanchez. McCann threw a perfect strike down there to Ibar. You watch the good jump that Brian has here. McCann getting rid of the ball. Perfect strike. But throws too late. Dozier's already in there. Sliding to the outside there. Kind of hooking it around, keeping his left hand on the back. Tying run at second. One out, 2 2 to Polanco.
Into the right field corner. Down for a hit. He'll tie the game and sprint for second base. Polanco round second on his way to third and he's in with a triple. Well that was a, just a great at bat heads up base running he took a peek out there and saw that J.D. wasn't getting to that ball with any sense of urgency and he knew that with a little momentum going around second base he could beat the throw to third which he does. But watch the pitch down and in and just all hands the more I see of Jorge Polanco the more I I see potential to be a great hitter over time because he's so quiet with his lower half and just throws those hands through the zone keeps a still head a level head see right there J.D. bobble it momentarily and that made the difference between a double and a triple. Polanco went into second and then took a second look and saw the juggle and yep. took off infield in now for Maurer and there's ball one. You now you keep waiting for Polanco to hit a an 0 for of any length at all 0 for 8 0 for 12 but he started hitting even when he was called up from a ball and however small the sample size has been he's avoided the overs he's hitting just over 300 but he's hitting 304 right handed 303 left handed and so far it doesn't appear that he has a lot of holes in his swing well it has uh, has had him climb the the lineup or he's now hitting second in the lineup and you know he started out way down there seven eight holes so Paul Molitor certainly has been impressed with his ability to swing the bat. You know baseball is a uncanny way of humbling everybody. If you play it long enough you're going to go through some slow. Oh, I know but it's just good to see a guy that seems to have it together that hitting is not a challenge or a, not not a chore for him. It kind of comes naturally, but he works at it. He studies a lot. He studies pitchers. He he takes batting practice seriously. He, he tries to work on things when he takes his swing. A lot of guys go up there and you know the goal is to see if they can hit it the second deck or the third deck. And I'm not sure that really helps them during game situations. Plonka doesn't do that. He goes up there, tries to hit some to the left, tries to hit some to the right, inside out pitches, you know, pulls some pitches. And juggled by Kinsler, and now here comes Polanco, and they're lucky to get Maurer. Kinsler with a rare miscue. He might have been caught looking at the runner at third. He didn't handle the ground ball. Couldn't have been a bad hop. It was hopping through the grass right to him, and Polanco gives the Twins a 2 1 lead. Well, again, very good base running by Polanco because he forces Kinsler to peak. And that little peak is probably all it took to. Boot that ball a little bit. You can see Polanco as soon as contact's made, he's busting a little bit. Kinsler does boot the ball, but Polanco reacts so well that he's able to scamber on home. Well, he's got a pitch up, fouled it straight back. Will Maurer will pick up an RBI for that. I like the way you describe Polanco. He appears to have it together, I believe, is what you said. Just think what they've asked him to do. He didn't play shortstop at all this year. No. Nope. He played second base, I think, one game in short in the minor leagues. And so they call him up here for a real good look, much like the look they've given Max Kepler. And they said, oh, yeah, by the way, our opening is on the left side of the infield. It's not at second base. And it hasn't obviously affected his hitting at all. But, you know, and he's played okay at short. When we talk about position changes, could there anything be more difficult than being asked to play up here, a position you didn't play all year in the minor leagues? Well, the knock on him was his arm at shortstop. And oh. Bluff takes a call third strike. We'll talk about this next half inning. Polanco with a big hit in a two run third inning, and the Twins have the lead.
Fans, if you can't catch the games on TV, you can stream them live on your mobile device with the all new Fox Sports Go app. Download the app, take Fox Sports North and Twins Baseball with you wherever you go. Just a three game homestand. Night game tonight, night game tomorrow, day game Thursday. And then the Twins make their only trip of the year to Toronto. And Jack Morris will be on the road trip as well. We'll be looking forward to working with him for the next week and a half. He almost gave a spit take there. What? Just the thought of working with me for a week and a half, and it almost made you choke. I'm all choked up. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Upton. Gibson fell behind him 3 0. Upton was green lighted, and he whistled a double into the left field corner. And the Tigers ended up taking two two out walks, including one with the bases loaded to get a run. And now missing inside one and one. No, I always look forward to going back to Toronto. You are revered there, Jack Morris. Revered. Well, I don't know if that's that's a stretch, but I appreciate you know trying to make me feel good about it. I just like the city. I I, I consider Chicago and Toronto two of the greatest big cities in North America. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I've told people for as long as I've been there, Toronto to me is everything New York City could be. It's a big yeah. metropolitan area, very diverse uh, ethnically. Just a joy to be spending time in Toronto. And speaking of diversity, today's diversity day. The Twins fans here tonight were treated with uh, some wonderfully diverse music pregame. Sounds of Blackness, one of my favorite groups, performed before the game. Three and one to Justin Upton. McGee will hit next. On the ground and under the glove of Polanco, who backpedaled. And it'll be a leadoff single in the fourth. Again, I have a tough time with the scoring on that one. I know the ball was hit hard. I realize that. But laying it is not the way to. You don't feel balls that way. I suppose there's people that say, well, why get hurt? Because <laughs> you might if you keep your hands down. Right. Might hit you in the wrist, might bounce off your chest. But you have a chance to make the play then. Here's McGee. Got a routine ground ball to Polanco in the second. Tigers trying to patch some holes on the left side of their infield because of injury. We told you about Castellanos. McGee picked up. A veteran with some power. One strike. Just missed the inside corner. Pitch count creeping up there for Kyle Gibson. And Gibson wants a different baseball. How persnickety were you with the baseballs? Well, I pitched in a day and age where they didn't just throw out everything and touch the dirt. Right. You know, I. I guess when I was young, I wanted a ball. I wanted to feel that tag. It wasn't so much of what it looked like. I didn't didn't have to be completely black, which most pitchers like. It could be white, but if I could get a attacking feel, that's what I wanted. I wanted to feel that certain amount of tackings. And uh, you know, it seemed like every new ball that was thrown in, I had to rub it up, a rub it up a little, spin on my hands, you know, just get a little moisture on the ball. To feel that, so I don't. <laughs> I might be the human rain delay in a game nowadays because every ball is new. One and two, and not two and two. I think one of the more finicky pitchers that I've seen in a Twins uniform is a good friend of both yours and mine, Rick Aguilera. He was he was very particular. It seemed like every other ball he picked up out there, he wanted out of the ball game. <laughs> Maybe he was superstitious. Two and two to McGee. Line to Plouffe, one away. Yeah. The Adam Ball sometimes your best friend. 
And that ball hit hard, but Trevor Plouffe right there. MLB.tv Premium, the number one live streaming sports service, delivers everything you've come to expect and more. Watch every out of market game live in HD on over 400 supported devices. It includes a free subscription to At Bat Premium, the number one app for live baseball. Blackout, other restrictions apply, of course. Visit MLB.tv for details. And now James McCann walked on four pitches when the Tigers got their run in the second. And the compound batters, Gibson walked. The number nine batter, Maven, to force in a run. McCall, uh, McCann, with average speed at best, it would really be nice for Kyle to get a ground ball here early in this count, get himself out of this inning with a double play. He's got 16 ground ball double plays on the year, roughly one per start. Well, tip, strike one. Originally known as a sinker ball pitcher, you would think that Kyle would get a lot more ground balls than he does. But he seems to throw up in the zone more than a lot of us feel like he should. He's got that good sinker, good movement down when he's on top of the ball. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball. Good slider right there. And those are the pitches that Kyle wants so much more than he actually gets. That ball ends up. Out of the zone, starts over the plate, ends up out of the zone, but he gets McCann to chase it. And that's the ideal scenario for a pitcher. Hard to hit a pitch that's not in the strike zone. Double play grounder, there head high hop for Polanco, hitting over. Just three men bad in a scoreless fourth, and the Twins have a 2 1 lead. Fox Sports North is presented by Northland Ford. Visit NorthlandFord.com and your local Northland Ford dealer today. And by Grand Casino. The best stories start here. What's yours? Twins with a two to one lead. Max Kepler will lead off the fourth. He single got as far as third base in the second inning. Outside ball one. Kepler had seen his average tumble down to the low 250s. Hasn't homered since that wonderful series he had in Cleveland. So Paul Molitor thought, let's give him a couple of days off. Oh, foul with an off day on Monday. He made a pinch hitting appearance on Sunday. But here's another guy. Just think, you know, everything that's been thrust upon him, getting a chance to play up here for the first time, and in very short order, he's hitting third in the lineup. I just wonder some 
sometimes about has anybody ever done a study? I'm sure somebody has. It's got to be researchable. Of a player that comes up to the big leagues for the first time playing on a bad team versus playing on a contending team. You know, and, and what the amount of time he plays, you know, how that varies from good teams to bad teams. In other words, you're in a pressure situation of a pennant race. You know, you got to believe those at bats are more meaningful. Right. So there's more stress on you versus, you know, Max Kepler coming up on the last place team. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to be derogatory. I'm just saying this is what it is. You know, you've got to be able to relax a little bit more and enjoy the whole ride right. when you don't have the pressure on you. Similarly, I think I mentioned it the other day too that uh, you pitched against the Twins of 1982 and they were bad. They lost 102 ball games to Billy Gardner in part because he didn't have any other options. He kept running out the likes of Gaetti and Bernanski and Lautner and Herbeck, and uh, they took their lumps. 102 losses will tell you that. Here's to know. <laughs> but. You know, I mean, you saw it from the other side. You saw five years later they were ready to win a world championship in part because they took their lumps. And, and my point is exactly that we were no different in Detroit. Our early Tiger teams with young Alan Trammells and Lou Whitakers and Kirk Gibsons, not very good. We got we got it handed to us most of the time, especially with the Yankees and the Brewers and the Orioles and the Red Sox in those years. Uh, they were just way better than we were. But I think in time, and that's what I'm hoping these young Twins players are going through right now, you get to a point where you're just tired of losing. You, you look across the field and you say, you know, we're as good as you are. You've just had your way with us. That's enough of that nonsense. And you go out there and show them that it's time to change the way the, the you know, ledger is. I'm sorry, he thought he went on that check swing. He did not. The at bat's still alive. In, in the terms of her in, uh, as it relates to Kepler, one, two to Sano. I know two and two. I don't know whether his heritage, not being from this country, will help him long term or not. You know, he, I think, said all the right things or tried to anyway when he went to Fenway Park and Yankee Stadium, you know, talking about the reverence of the history of the ballpark. But I don't think it was the same for Max Kepler. Hearing about Fenway Park, what little he heard when he was living in Berlin, as opposed to somebody who grew up here. Again, I don't want this to come out sounding the wrong way, but I think it's a generational thing. I don't think players today are infatuated with nostalgia in the history of the game. Yeah. So no grounds to third, two down. With two down, Eddie Rosario will bat. We will give you tonight's. Harsuit.com trivia question. Who is the only Twins player to homer twice in an inning? And I know the answer to this. So I'm going to recuse myself Was it from the me? competition. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You were long retired by then. Oh, okay. So it wasn't Herbert. Here is Rosario. Lifted foul out of play, one strike. Rosario hit a weak little pop up caught by Ibar and it was a costly out because the Twins had Kepler at third with one out. And now Rosario waves and misses 0 2. The veteran Sanchez has Rosario in an 0 2 hole again. Dribbled right side. Kinsler. Flips and it's a one, two, three, fourth for Annabelle Sanchez.
Tigers, and we are in the fifth inning in the Minnesota Lottery Winner's Circle with Darren Holland from Bloomington, who is celebrating his 50th birthday tonight and game number 2,364, and he's not kidding. You are a season ticket holder, Darren, and apparently a loyal one at that. Uh, yes, I am. When is the last game you missed? It would have been in uh, May of 2011. May of 2011. You've hit every home game since then. That's correct. You've been here more than Dick Bramer. Uh, I would say so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Dick. <laughs> How, about That's all right. How about Marnie? That's all right. <laughs> you know what? Uh, congratulations. That's, uh, that's loyalty. That's impressive. And happy 50th birthday to you, Darren. Oh, thanks a lot, Marnie. Hope you get a big, a big victory win tonight. That would be nice. Guys, let's get one for Darren. All That's right. Pretty impressive. We've seen Darren around the ballpark for years. He is one of the uh, died of the wool twins fans. So congratulations on your 50th. It's not 60 like Paul Molitor, but it's 50. That's pretty good. Halfway there, right? <laughs> 3 and 0 to Maven. And Maven draws another walk from Gibson. This one, a leadoff walk. It was the two out walk in the second that led to the Tiger run, a bases loaded one. Third walk for Kyle and twice now walking the number nine hitter this time to lead off an inning that usually is disastrous for a pitcher Kyle's pitch count creeping up there he has definitely not had the command tonight that he did his last start in Atlanta but he's been battling still has a lead to work with so we'll see if he can get a ground ball here get out of this inning without a whole lot more pitches. Kinsler's been struggling a little bit as of late he's 0 for 2 tonight. Maven can run a little bit. He's checked it first. Kinsler hitless in his last 12 at bats. Just one hit in 24 at bats in the homestand for the Tigers. Delayed strike call 0 and 1. Now Maven basically took over the center field position for Anthony Ghost, who was with the Tigers for a couple of years, formerly with Toronto. And Ghost, uh, Ghost has been down at Triple A. I don't know if he's going to see the big leagues again. Yeah, he's been yeah down a little, to Double A there for a yeah, while. Yeah, a little uh, incident in Triple A, and they demoted him to Double A. Strike to Kinsler and Gibson now has to worry about Maven at first after the leadoff walk. Gibson hoping for another ground ball hit at somebody. Chop foul 0 and 2. You just think about pitching out of the windup versus pitching out of the stretch when you have a little guy on base or you don't have anybody on base. How much quicker the pace of game can be. When you don't have to pause, you don't have to interrupt your delivery towards home because there's a base runner over there. The game slows down by design every single time there's a runner on base. Looking over your left shoulder at the runner all the time. There goes Maven, got a good jump. Centeno's throw skips into center field, and Maven will run for third base, and he reaches safely. So a stolen base and an error, and the tying runs at third with nobody out. Well, did I mention how those leadoff walks usually are not a good thing? Maven a good jump. Centeno didn't get the greatest pitch to handle. A fastball up and away, and his ball got by Doge over there at second base. With his good speed, Cameron Maven gets over to third base, 90 feet away from tying this game. One and two to Kinsler. Twins will play the infield halfway in here. Breaking ball tap foul. You mentioned earlier, Dick, how oh, this guy, even though he's a leadoff man, this is where he puts up some great numbers. Nobody out, a runner at third. He somehow puts the ball in play most of the time in these situations. Blocked by Centeno. 
Even the first pitch for Kyle Gibson. Hey, you were a pretty observant pitcher when you were out there. When you saw a hitter like Kinsler who stands where he stands, not on the back line, but a foot, maybe even a foot and a half ahead of the back line, what's he telling you? Well, unfortunately, I know him very well as a hitter, but he likes to crowd the plate. He likes the ball in. Backhanded by Plouffe. Good and play. a good play, keeping Maven at third base. Much, much needed out right there. Good play by Trevor Plouffe. When you see a hitter crowd the plate, in other words, he's up on the plate, that means he really is comfortable on the inner part. He likes the ball in. And he's forcing you to make every pitch in. As we watch this replay by Trevor, quick focus, sees that Maven's not going anywhere, but he's right in front of him. Makes a nice throw across the diamond to Joe. And now Ibar in the infield will play in a few more steps with one away. In ball one. There were a lot of hitters in my era who liked to stand on the plate. That didn't mean they could hit the ball in. But they wanted, maybe they wanted the ball away and they were just closer. Right. That was like in their sweet spot when you, they're up on the plate. In Kinsler's case, though, he was up from the back line of the box. I mean, his right foot was well, in the middle of the back. What, what it might be telling me is that he's looking to get that his breaking ball before it starts breaking. That okay. Kyle's, you know, breaking ball might be breaking a little late. So if he gets up on there, he's gonna he's gonna lessen the the amount of break the pitch has. Two and zero oh to Ibar with Cabrera on deck. Big man for Gibson to get. And it's hit to right center field. He's not gonna get him. That lands safely a base hit. Ibar digging for second. Here's the throw from Rosario and got him at second base. What a throw by Eddie Rosario. To get Ibar at second. Type of throw we saw regularly from left field. That might be his best throw from center field. I'm not sure what Eric Ibar was thinking there, other than the fact that he wanted to get into scoring position. But that ball did not get by Eddie Rosario, and he's barely touching first base when Rosario gets to the ball. And we all know, Twins fans know, what kind of arm Eddie Rosario has. But look at how accurate this one is. Right to Brian Dozier. And even with a good slide, Ivar is out. We saw Fox Tracks presented by Dodge. Bases empty, two down. Now in a tie game, and Cabrera swings through strike one. Rosario running away from the infield with a pirouette and a one hop strike. And now one strike to Cabrera. One and one. Getting a little help from his friends. Kyle Gibson there. A nice play from Eddie Rosario to get, record the second out after a base hit. So not only does it take away a base runner, but Kyle can now go out of the windup. You know, we saw those types of throw uh, throws from him last year as a left fielder running to his left, running to his right. And there were a few where he charged, but it was the Atypical throws like the one we just saw that really set him apart. The accuracy right. with which he was able to throw. Yeah, he has a, a plus throwing arm, but how accurate those throws are really determines more than anything about the number of assists he gets. One and two to Miguel Cabrera. Got him again. If Gibson could just not walk Cameron Megan, he'd have a shutout going here, but Rosario with a big throw from center field. Keep the Tigers to just one run in the inning.
our Mountain Dew fan of the game excited because school is right around the corner. <laughs> and she's at a Twins game. She could be excited for school. Let's hope she is. Yeah. Here's Juan Santana. We take strike one. He'll be followed by Danny Santana and then Brian Dozier. I'm pretty sure she's excited to be at a Twins game. <laughs> Now off one on one. Were you an eager student about this time of the year, looking forward to your uh, next school year when you were a young lad? Vocally, I'd probably say no. But in truth, I think all of us missed our friends. And we're excited to get back yeah. amongst them. Two and one to Centeno. Pulls foul and it's two and two. Sanchez pitch count a little bit better than Kyle Gibson's. He's been uh, better again here, better than he was early in the year. Had a, a lot of games where he never saw the fifth or sixth inning. This is approaching the time of the game where that's really giving him trouble. Though there's a little pop up left field, a long run for Upton and for Ibar who runs into short left to make the catch. Good thing for the Tigers because Upton was not going to get there. <laughs> he wanted no part of that ball. Ibar had to run a 100 yard dash, but he got to it. One down. That'll bring up Danny Santana. He bunted back to the pitcher Sanchez on the first pitch of the third inning. Santana struggling. The Twins giving him. Regular starting time now in left field. Starting right field, and he jumps on go. the first pitch and lines a single to right. It's been a little bit of a dry spell for Danny. Good ball sticking with him. Santana now with 12 steals and 21 tries. He's at first with one out. See this last pitch. Much down and in. Nice swing from Santana. Again, a lot like Jorge Polanco. They four, both very still lower body. Use their hands, keep the head the still head. Here's Dozier, who has, again tonight, not had real good swings against Sanchez. He got a hit, scored a run after a stolen base in the third. But he hit a pitch up in his eyes and somehow topped it in front of McGee for an infield hit. Just his third hit in 25 at bats against Anibal Sanchez. Strike call in the outside corner. And that run led to the first of two runs that the Twins got that inning. It's going to go down as line drive in the box score tomorrow, right? That's what we used to say. Yeah. No matter how you get them, just get them. Dug out. Blocked by McCann. Santana will try to advance out at second base. At least that is the original call. Nice recovery by McCann and a strong throw. And Paul Molitor has his left foot out of the dugout. Somebody will take a look at it. Sean Harlan. Well, Danny sees this ball block or in the dirt a little bit. But it looked like he had a real strong. Purpose in running down to second base. He, it almost looked like he started and stopped and went again. I don't know whether he tagged him or not. The right foot got in, and the question is where and when did Kinsler actually tag Santana's other leg? And I'll bet you that's the discussion right now with Sean Harlan. And there'll be no challenge apparently. I think what you're seeing managers more and more. Tell their video guys it's got to be convincing. And yeah, I think he got it. I, don't know. I just think it'd be hard to overturn. High and deep to left center field. Maybe going back on the warning track at the wall. Gone. Brian Dozier with a home run, a career high, number 29. Well, Dozier does it again. Happy to be back home where he's done a phenomenal job here since the All Star break. Just in on some kind of roll with the home run ball. Home run number 29. A couple of runs scored tonight. 77 on the year. See this pitch up and away. Dozier just keeps his front shoulder in. 
That's a great swing right there. Even though he still ended up pulling that ball slightly towards left center. The fact that he kept his front shoulder in his head still. Good concentration nice swing. And we mentioned it in Kansas City. I really think Paul Molitor hit the nail on the head regarding Dozier. Who's getting a few hits to right field and right center field. But Paul said he likes the vector of Brian's home runs now. They're not going down the line. And he's not hitting those hook hooking a line drives down the line anymore. He's hitting home runs here into the bullpen and left center to center. Yep. Yep. And you know the home runs to left field are still coming as well. So he's broadening his range his angle of home runs now drive to right center field and Maben goes into a slide and makes the catch not sure why they've lost the ball on the lights Tigers got a run in the fifth so did the twins on Brian Dozier's 29th of the year. Putting them back in front. Aaron Mabin took a big chunk of the sod out in center field. Now Kyle Gibson pitching to the Tigers in the sixth. They'll face Victor Martinez, J.D. Martinez, and Justin Upton. Starting the inning with 89 pitches thrown. Over the inside corner. Now number 90, so there's a good chance this will be the last inning for Kyle. Brian Dozier just gave him another lead to work with. See if you can get that first hitter. Rain starting to come down a little bit here at Target Field. And that's hit to left, the base hit. And Martinez has his second hit. The second inning single he got was an infield hit. That guy can flat out hit. And I know he's done extremely well against the Twins. But I think he's one of the most professional hitters in the game. Well, look where the pitch was. Yeah. J.D. Martinez has struck out twice tonight against Kyle Gibson. Whoa! And that to the backstop, and Victor Martinez will go to second. I wonder if that ball slipped out of his hand, maybe. I think that was by design right there. Gibson usually right around the plate. That one clearly got away from him somehow. Yeah. See where the target was. Ball just slipped way up and in. Wild pitch, and now the time oh. around in scoring position. One to know to JD Martinez. On the ground and a base hit, Victor Martinez. Inch back towards second base. 
And now the inning starts for the Tigers with a pair of singles, first and third. Nobody out for Justin Upton. That's been one of the liabilities for the Tigers with Victor on base. He just his legs are so worn out that it almost takes two hits to score him from second base. A lot of base runners would score on that one, but not Victor. And now first and third, nobody out. Kyle Gibson, 94th pitch coming up. Justin Upton has hit two balls very hard against Gibson tonight. A double into the left field corner in the second. And then he hit a smash right at Jorge Polanco, who kind of laid the play. The ball skipped into center field for a leadoff hit. They're open for a ground ball double play here. Concede the tying run to try to the damage to a minimum here in the sixth. Well, Upton, he has the kind of power to leave the yard on one swing. You want to be careful with him here. Strike on the outside corner, but we mentioned the strikeouts. Well, he's got two hits tonight. 444 at bats, 143 strikeouts. Gibson, not much of a strikeout pitcher, but this is a guy who can be got. He can be, but when he's in one of those hot swings. Oh, Centeno had no chance. The no. ball kicks over by the Twins dugout. And the tying run scores on a wild pitch. Gibson really erratic here in the sixth. Threw one under Martinez's chin, and now this one hooked into the left handed batter's box. Yeah, that's just trying to be too fine again. He chokes this slider. Release point way too late. You're right, Centeno had no chance. He falls well behind the left fielder's batter's box. Left handed hitter's batter's box. So now the go ahead run at second base and JD. Tie game still nobody out here in the sixth. A couple of hits and a couple of costly wild pitches. And now inside well off the plate two and one. Kyle really missing. This particular inning. Breaking ball misses three and one. I remember, I remember pitching coaches telling me, you know, when you miss by a foot on either side, you can't expect that close pitch to be called. Umpires just are not going to give you that borderline pitch when you're showing them that you're too erratic initially. Yeah, Centeno does a nice job blocking that one first and second. Nobody out. Gibson's going to be taken out of the game here. Got into the six, but didn't pitch well in the sixth inning. He's given back the lead. The Tigers are threatening to take the lead with nobody out. Runners at first and second. Well, the fourth walk will be the end of the night for Kyle. When Gibson comes out. Tonkin will come in with a couple of inherited runners in a tie game.
in his last start, but you have to allow for the fact that his last start was against the Atlanta Braves, and he ended up giving eight hits, three runs. He walked three in nine innings, and facing a much tougher lineup here tonight. Well, pitch count again is his demise. I mean, he just didn't throw enough strikes. I know he's trying to be a little more careful to some of these Tiger hitters, but it just shows how important it is to attack the strike zone. Now, Michael Tonkin pitching his 54th game will try to be the guy to put out the fire here for Detroit. And you look at a couple of things they really need to get three outs here from the bottom third of the Tiger lineup, starting with McGee. Tonkin's done really well with the first batters he's faced. He's also done okay with inherited runners. 31% of them have scored. McGee is 0 for 2. McCann's 0 for 1 with a walk, and Mabin hasn't swung the bat yet tonight. He's walked twice. Corner infielders up here in the event McGee is asked to drop one down. And a belt high strike. One of the things that Michael's worked on, and I think he's done, he's done a better job, is keeping runners and not just having them take off. He was just in a terrible rut of never even looking at a runner, and they'd get tremendous jumps off of him. It's still third base, so and a little more of a hesitation, a couple double looks at the runners. On the outside corner, 0 and 2. And doing a great job of pounding the strike zone early in the count. Got to believe that infield grass is starting to get a little bit moist. Yeah, it's been a pretty steady rain here for the last seven, eight minutes. Oh, and two to McGee. And that oh. kicks away from Centeno. Another wild pitch. Well, this hasn't been a case of the Twins giving up some clutch hits. The first Tiger run scored on a bases loaded one. Then the leadoff walk to the same batter, Mabin. And now here in the sixth inning, the third wild pitch. Now Centeno didn't do a great job of getting his body in front of that. He tried to backhand it, but still that ball was well out of the strike zone. He's got to shift over and get those knees on the ground, put that chest in front of the ball if he can. One and two to Casey McGee in a tie game. Fouled away. Duncan reaching back with a 94 mile per hour fastball. And the rain seems to be coming down a little heavier now. Twins have had 12 rain delays or postponements here at Tiger, or at Tiger Target Field alone. Oh, inside nearly hit him two and two. They've had four of them on the road, including the marathon delay in Kansas City Friday night. James McCann on deck. That was a marathon. It's part of the game sometimes, but what a long afternoon, evening, and morning for both sides. Tap foul up the line. Here in the sixth inning, a couple of hits, three wild pitches, a walk. Tonkin trying to get the first out of the inning. Very important part of this game. The game is really made or break in these kind of situations. Michael Tonkin comes in, wild pitches both runners in the scoring position. Nobody out. Tigers already with one on the board to tie the game. This hit to right center. May score JD. He's tagging. And they hold him. Oh. Wow. Thank you. JD Martinez came a fourth of the way down the line. Rosario's throw wasn't good at all, but they held him at third, one away. That was, I thought, plenty deep to score the run. There's Dave Clark, the third base coach for Detroit, and he's the one to make that decision. And I think it has a lot to do with. The reputation and the strong throwing and accurate throwing arm at times, although we didn't see that in Kansas City from wow. Eddie Rosario. That was one of his worst throws of the year in terms of being on target. I think he was trying to throw the ball to third base. I don't think he had any intention of trying to throw it home. 
Well, it looks like his shoulders were more square to third base than home plate. You might be right. And he threw it somewhere in between. Infield in. And the ball flared foul. Well, what a huge, got, huge out though to get that. Now you got a chance to. Cam's hitting 210. If you can get him, he's the you guy can throw strikes to Maven, you might get out of it. Yeah, he's the guy in the lineup you want at the plate right now. One strike to McCann. Just missed the corner with a breaking ball. Trying to keep this a 3 3 game. Liner to short, two down. A bullet hit right at Polanco for the second out. And now Maven. So Maven playing with a sprained left thumb. It's his bottom hand. And the Twins haven't thrown him any strikes yet. He's walked twice. Walked in a run in the second. Walked and scored in the fifth. There's a fastball and strike one. Tigers got their run in the second but left the bases full. And now Tonkin trying to weave his way through this sixth inning and keep it a tie game. Breaking ball lined up the middle of base hit. Martinez scores up and behind him, and here's the throw to the plate cut off. And now they'll get Maven in a rundown. And that is the third out. But Maven with two big walks and maybe a bigger two run single in the sixth. And the Tigers have a 5 3 lead. They're enjoying having it. Never made it. Great game. Twins finally threw him a strike. And he lined a two run single to put the Tigers up 5 3. Now Mauer, Bluff, and Kepler will hit against Sanchez in their hand of the six. All those runs were charged to Kyle Gibson. So he'll leave the game with no chance to win, but a, a chance to maybe be the losing pitcher. Mauer takes up an in ball one. Joe with a single in the first and then drove in Polanco from third with a ground ball in the third. It was Bowers 800th run batted in of his big league career. Line foul one on one. Twins looking for win number 50. They've lost 75. 
They are two and seven against the Tigers, but the two wins have come in the last two ball games. They won the last two games in Detroit as part of that nice road trip that they had after the All Star break. Inevitably, it's not going to get any easier to play in Detroit, who has a shot at the postseason. Then they go to Toronto, a first place club in the East, and then go out to Cleveland, the first place club in the Central. One down, that'll bring up Trevor Blue. The uh, guy is Michael Kadir, who did it on this date in 09. Did you know that? Did I you did. Know it was I, on I, this date? I did. It was. Uh, Someone that I follow on Twitter mentioned that earlier today. Oh, okay. So you got a little heads up. So you really didn't know it until until I you, you kind of were given a heads up. To right. Me. Popped up near the mound. Ploof has gone quickly again. He's over three, and that'll bring up Kemper. Well, still pretty impressive. And a great player, a great friend. He was in town here last yeah. week to do a youth clinic, and uh, Michael's still under the employ of the New York Mets, but. Feeling he can do pretty much whatever he wants to do if he chooses to stay in the game in some capacity. Yep. One of the good guys. Here's Kepler with two down, and he takes strike one. Where the Twins, specifically Kyle Gibson, guilty of some really critical walks here tonight. The Twins haven't taken one against Sanchez. Outside, it's one and one. We talked about it to start the game that Sanchez is all about his command and when he's pitching well this is the kind of plan that he has get ahead and then expand the zone. McGee stays with the hopper fires across and a very quick one two three six for out about Sanchez. Story of the game. Now the Tigers have the lead. Jorge Polanco gets a double that actually turns into a triple. And then Joe Maurer hits the ball to Ian Kinsler that bobbles. Great base running there by Polanco to score the second Twins run. Brian Dozier gets his 29th career high home run to put the Twins up ahead 3 to 2. And then Detroit comes back with a pair of runs on that base hit right there by Cameron Maven. And right now, the Tigers lead 5 3. Sanchez threw all of seven pitches to set the Twins down in order in the bottom of the sixth. Now to the seventh, and Ian Kinsler will lead things off strike one. That was one of the things about the Kansas City series that I know was particularly distressing to Paul Molitor the number of quick, for lack of a better term, feeble innings where the Twins were retired one, two, three on six, seven pitches. Ian Kennedy uh, did a great job. It was uh, well pitched from the starters of Kansas City in that series. Two strikes to Kinsler, and now a ball.
Kinsler 0 for 3. A line out to Kepler in right field. He fouled out in the key spot, leaving the bases full in the second. Then he hit a ground ball to Plute behind the bag in the fifth. And out to Polanco. Come down. We'll bring up Eric Ivo. For the most part, I think Polanco has done a great job at shortstop. He's making the plays he's supposed to make. Yeah, he doesn't have that lights out throwing arm going to his right deep in the hole. But how many guys do? I mean, that's a tough play for almost every fielding shortstop. So if you can make the balls plays to your left and the ones in front of you, and I think for the most part, Polanco's done that. Hey, you had playing behind you a guy who I think should be in the Hall of Fame, Alan Trammell. He was, as I recall, not a spectacular shortstop. He was a great hitter and made all the routine plays, and he and Lou Whitaker were great up the middle for a decade and a half. But I mean, is, am I wrong? What was Trammell able to go into the hole and make that play and come up with a rifle throw across the diamond? No question about it. But, you know, Alan Trammell's knock for not getting in the hall is he didn't do anything with flash. Right. He was what you would teach. He would be the poster child for how to properly position yourself and get in proper throwing position to get rid of a ball. He didn't do anything flashy. He didn't right. do backflips, you know, but he hit higher than a guy who's in the Hall of Fame who did those. Right. Uh, and he played a high over. blast to right field. That's gone. High ball lifts one deep to right and gone a home run. And the Tigers now lead six to three. His first home run as a Tiger. He only hit two for the Braves this year. Well, the second hit of the game for newly acquired Eric Ibar. Picked up an RBI in the fifth inning with a base hit. Picks up another one here with his home run. Box tracks presented by Carrier. Oh boy. He put a good swing on a bad pitch. It looked like. Tight to Cabrera. A little chirping from the Tiger dugout. They saw Gibson throw high and tight to JD Martinez, and now the first pitch to Cabrera under his chin. Each team with a home run. With the Twins have gift wrapped a few runs for the Tigers here tonight. Line to left. And that'll one hop the wall. Cabrera will be held. Oh, he's going to try for two. Here's Santana's throw. And cut off. Not in time. Cabrera hustles to second on a double. Now Tonkin has faced six batters and given up three hits. Yeah, they've been back to back lasers. That one was over Danny Santana's head in a hurry. One hops the wall. He thought Miguel might stay at first. But he saw that the throw wasn't in line to second base, so he chugged a lugs it on into second base and beats the throw. That's the swing right there that you're talking about with Miguel Sano. They have the same same type of power, but what an easy swing. Cabrera crushes that ball into left field. And now Victor Martinez, two hits, two runs scored. Outside ball one. Martinez with an infield hit leading off the second. And he came around to score on a bases loaded walk. On a leadoff single in the sixth when the Tigers took advantage of walks and wild pitches and a clutch hit by Maven to score three times. Another blast to right. And this is long gone. A two run home run, three straight extra base hits for the Tigers, and they have busted it open. Have I ever mentioned to you that I think Victor Martinez is a professional hitter? He does so many things right at the plate. So really a disappointing outing here for Michael Tonka, who got a couple of big outs in the six, but then gave up the two-run single, and now he's greeted with a home run double and home run on another pitch left up and lifted easily out of the ballpark. Both both home run pitches are balls that are center of the plate one a little bit higher the one to Victor Martinez a little bit higher than the one to Eric Ivar. Eight to three Detroit. And 
J.D. Martinez will hit. And here comes Paul Molitor. Went stalled a little bit. Victor, baseball, leaving the bat a lot faster than as it was approaching the bat. Quick trip to the mound for Paul Molitor. He'll get Michael Tonkin out with the Tigers scoring three in the sixth and three so far in the seventh. Pat White's about to make his Twins debut. Organization for Fernando Abad, and he throws hard. He's got a wicked split finger pitch, and he's a big guy, 6'5, 220. Yeah, he supposedly throws hard. He can touch close to triple digits. It'll be interesting to see how he handles this situation. It's, it's always intriguing to me to see a guy come to an organization midsummer, late summer. His teammates really don't know anything about him. Spent his most of his career so far in the minor leagues has been in the big leagues with the Red Sox. But first chance he has to pitch here for the Twins. And it'll be J.D. Martinez. Light can throw 100 miles per hour. He's got a split finger pitch that he has an awful lot of confidence in. And we'll see what he can do here to make a, a good a Twins debut. That's 94 and down and away ball one. Like it split the plate to me. Ninety four and fouled away one and one. Fernando Abad, who Twins had to add him to the forty man roster coming out of spring training, he pitched well for the Twins, but the Twins trading Abad to the Red Sox for Pat Light. Light made a couple of, of appearances for the Red Sox. It didn't go particularly well. well. That might have been the splitter left up, and it spanked hard into left field for a single. Something off speed, and Light gives up a single to J.D. Martinez. J.D. who started the game with two strikeouts from Kyle Gibson, now has backed it up with two straight hits. You look at Light's minor league record, and remembering, of course, that Ryan Presley came out of the Red Sox system, and kind of the the same uh, pattern in their two professional careers. Light really didn't uh, pitch with much distinction until they moved him to the bullpen. Like Presley, a failed starter, at least in the minor leagues, and in his last year as a starter. At Salem, 22 starts and an ERA of just under five. But then the next year, better results as a relief pitcher. See it all the time at yeah. this level. I, I just think that's the only way it works. You never see a failed closer <laughs> become a freaking phenomenal starter. Derek Lowe went back and forth for a while, and uh, but he was the exception. 
John Smoltz did both. Yeah. And he was yeah. very good. Hall of Famer at both. Two and oh. Swing and a miss at 95. Paul Molitor was asked today in his session with the media about hard throwing relievers, high end velocity guys. And the start of his answer began interestingly. Where do you consider now? High velocity yeah. to begin. <laughs> 95 really doesn't do it anymore. Well, we just saw a couple of 95 mile an hour fastballs go 380 and 395 <laughs> feet. So, but now that's in, that's what he's talking about. Right. And Paul was a guy who could handle the fastball. It didn't matter how hard it was. Right. Uh, and I, I love the way he answered the question. Where do you start? Because. Rawls Chapman throwing 103. Right. Twins just saw a guy that was clocked at 102 or 103 the other day. Who the heck was that? that you and Bert were talking about. There's a strike and it's three and two. Herrera could get up into the upper yeah, 90s. Yeah, Herrera can touch 100. But when you were with the Tigers all those years, you're on some really good ball clubs. The typical reliever through what? Just your average guy, 88, 89. Yeah, yeah, your average guy. If a guy threw in the low 90s, he was considered a power guy. And that splitter that was freezes. Nice. Upped it for a strikeout. Two down. A 3-2 splitter, I believe. Something off speed. Well, it broke like a slider. Well, yeah, maybe. But maybe that is his splitter. Maybe he throws it more crossbody instead of straight over the top. Yeah. Great movement, and it's right there. Locked up a hot hitter in Justin Upton. Here's Casey McGee with two down. Down and away ball one. We've seen 94, 95. We haven't seen anything close to 100 yet. You know, it's such an argumental subject to talk about. What's more important, command or velocity? Right. Especially when you're talking relievers. Rosario's going to try to chase this and reaches at the end. That ball had a little more lift and carry than he thought. Twins debut for Pat Light with the Tigers score three against Michael Cotton. of baseball presented by Team Mobile a look around the majors your Dono Ventura with a good game for the Royals they've now won nine straight a season high winning streak remember the Indians earlier this year kind of took control of the division with a 14 gamer Gregory Polanco with three hits for the Pirates and the Pirates hanging in the fringes of the National League wildcard race and let's hope Russell Martin gets all the extra base hits and hitting done now because the Twins go to Toronto from here after the game on Thursday. We have some coming back to do. A couple of three run innings have found them now five runs back. There's ball one outside to Miguel Sano. Two ground balls pulled to the left side tonight for the twin slugger. Swing and a miss. 
kind of see the pattern from up here. Usually we've got a really good seat almost directly right behind home plate, and we can see what from the other direction what you viewers can see at home from the center field camera. Almost invariably, the catcher sets up down and away. There's a high fly to center field. Maven back and now cutting over. Lost it for a while, it appeared. I'm not sure how on a pitch black sky like we have here tonight, but he made the catch. One away. As a reminder this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent of the Minnesota Twins. You're going to be reading that uh, in three different cities, two different countries for the next week and a half, and you will never read it any better than you just did right there. I challenge you <laughs> tomorrow to read it better. I should have it memorized, but I don't. <laughs> Now Maven comes in and it's a left fielder Upton with a catch and Rosario's quickly retired two down. Another quick two outs yeah. already. Nobody sees sports quite the way Colin Cowherd and Jason Whitlock do. The brains to know, the guts to say. Catch Colin and Jason on FS1's new daily sports talk show. Speak for yourself weekdays at 5 p.m. Central. By my count, that's five outs on the last ten pitches thrown by Annabelle Sanchez. That's Hardly that, that making it work. And that's what you were talking how frustrated Paul was in Kansas City for a couple of the games. They, they get a big lead and twins go up there and just don't have good approaches. Not, not working the count at all. It's unfortunately it's the same old thing. Since Dozier's home run that gave the twins a lead, he's retired six men in a row and he gets ahead of Centeno 0 and 2. On the opposite side, Tiger's got to be pretty happy with another effort from Annabelle Sanchez here, pitching in the seventh inning, kind of breezing through and a five run lead to work with. Outside. One and two. He's won one ball game since May 4th. But pitched well his last time out. Only as we said, struggled on the road, but not so much here tonight. Although three earned runs, Twins uh, kind of scattered their hits. They never really hit more or got more than two hits. He hasn't walked anybody. And then after being given the lead, he's really got some quick outs, one and two to Centeno, and he takes up and away. Well, really, since the third inning, the Twins just haven't. Like Paul likes to say, grind out in the back. Right. Yep. Brian Dozier got the home run in the fifth. And other than that, it's been pretty quick innings for Sanchez. JT Chagua warming up and Centeno to center, leaping catch made by Ibar. And the Twins go down one, two, three against, again against veteran Annabelle Sanchez.
Mall of America studio with this update on this date in Twins history back in 2009. Michael Kadire went deep twice against the Kansas City Royals in the same inning. He had two home runs in the seventh inning. Twins won the game 10-3. That's the only time since the Twins franchise moved to the Twin Cities in 1961. The players homered twice in the same inning. Dick and Jack. Well, thank you. That's back in the good old days when the Twins would go to Kansas City. If it was a four-game series, the Twins figured they were going to win three. Yep. If it was a three-game series, the Twins figured they were going to win three. Changing of the guard. Yeah. JT Chagua will come out of the Twins bullpen pitch to the Tigers here in the eighth inning. Apparently Anthony Lapanta knew what you knew <laughs> about Michael Kadire. In case you're wondering in franchise history only one senator ever did it. Jim Lemon who would later become a longtime hitting coach for the Twins did it yeah. as part of the. And this, I, I know this is going to sound almost blasphemous to NFL fans. Part of the original fearsome foursome. As the ball lifted to right field and deep. Kepler back. And it'll play it off the wall. And digging for second is McCann. And the throw into Polanco. It's a leadoff double. Do you care to elaborate on that? The first? original fearsome foursome. And it's going to bother me because. The fourth guy is you, you forget I, the fourth he's guy. right there. He's right there. It's Jim Lemon, Bob Allison, Harmon Killebrew. And another guy. Yeah. Somebody on Twitter will answer it for it's me. Carl Allen or Alan Page. No, no, no. The original fearsome foursome, the Rams. Larson. Yeah, the Ram. That was the, you're talking about the purple people leaders. Yeah. The fearsome foursome. Right. The Rams, Deacon Jones right. and Merlin Olson and, right. and Rosie Greer and and one other guy. <laughs> oh, it's going to bother me, and then I'm going to find out about it. And I'm not figuratively. I'm literally going to kick myself because I should know who it is. Well, I got to give you a hint. I wasn't the other guy in any of those. Two. Okay. <laughs> May have been the batter after the leadoff double by McCann against J.T. Chagua. Had a chance to talk with J.T. before the game today. He and his family are. Comparatively high and dry. He's a Cajun from Louisiana, and of course, a good part of the state of Louisiana has been underwater tragically. And uh, thankfully, JT's immediate family has survived the flooding down there. Swing and a miss, and it's one and two. Crazy weather, isn't it? Burning up in California, flooding in the south. Wilson warming up. Been a pretty wet year here in Minnesota, I would say. You know, August has always been so dry. And, you know, we get not just rain, not just periodic rain, but heavy rain. Here's a ball hit shot uh, to Dozier, who plays it over to Maurer. Maven retired and on the play. McCann goes to second. Ian Kinsler will bat next. Dozier's deck is back September 10th. A limited number. Of special ticket packages includes a game ticket and limited edition Brian Dozier blaze orange stocking cap and a portion of the proceeds from every ticket purchased benefits pheasants forever for details and tickets visit twinsbaseball.com slash Dozier's deck the blaze orange out won't be long Jack Morris will no. be out in the field hunting those roosters I heard there's uh, plenty of them again this year out in the Dakotas up and in ball one. Kinsler 0 for 4 and his batting average now down to 276 usually when the Twins are playing the Tigers Dozier is one of their hottest hitters. Thank you someone in the truck just fine I've been punishing myself Roy Seavers was the other member of the fearsome force with the senators with the senators right in the late 50s. And Lamar Lundy was the other member of the fearsome foursome football. And here's a fly to right Kepler running towards the line. He'll be able to throw right down the baseline if he makes the catch. Here comes the throw and McCann thinks better of it and he'll be held at third. He looked at the throw yep. and I think he made that decision and not Dave Clark two away. I think that was great base running right there. James McCann tagged and he goes towards the line the whole time watching Max Kepler to see first of all if he's going to catch the ball and second of all how 
accurate his throw is and he determined on his own about halfway down the line that you know what this is going to be too close for me I'm going to go back but that was good base running right there and a pretty good play by Kepler he had to catch the foul ball and take it away from the fan in the first place and then fired right down the line strike on the outside corner anyway the Washington Senators fearsome force a predated the football fearsome force by a few years. But I imagine there's a bunch of L.A. Rams fans that did not know that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they did. I mean, because I know the, it. the fearsome. Every foursome. day I work with you, I get an education, <laughs> and I did not know that. Well, and I, the only reason I knew it is, uh, you know, through my association with Harmon and Bob Allison, and yeah. to a lesser extent Jim Lemon, and they kept telling me about this fearsome foursome they had. Now, do you think that was? Obviously, that had to be uh, coined by the press. Sure, yeah. but it was the press in D.C. Not yet, and the senators weren't very good, so people didn't hear about that fearsome force too much. Two and one to Eric Ibar. He over to right his last time up. Drove in a run with a single in the fifth inning. Shake well, one out away from getting out of this inning without giving up a run. Rounder to short to take care of it. Polanco scoops. Fires and a good inning for Chagua, a scoreless eight. Tigers lead by five. Tigers as we are about to start the bottom of the eighth inning and coming up after the final out we will bring you twins live presented by CenturyLink and tonight we'll take a look at the opportunistic offense that the Detroit has had tonight taking advantage of all kinds of opportunities that the twins have given to the Tigers plus how some speed at the top of Minnesota's order has helped out the twins Brian Dozier beat out an infield single and stole a base Jorge Polanco legged out a triple and we'll hear from manager Paul Molitor all after the final out and hopefully before the rain gets too hard, Dick and Jack. Yeah, we don't need what, another what rain. rain? Right? What, what's she talking about? Marty. Rain Rain's is gone. Coming down a little bit harder than it has the last couple of innings. Bottom of the eighth, Danny Santana will lead things off against Alex Wilson. Outside, ball one. It'll be Santana, Dozier, and Polanco. Sanchez ended his night by retiring the last seven batters. Oakland is leading Cleveland three to nothing just in the second inning out of the Bay Area. And we already told you that Kansas City won their game right. right. So Detroit and KC could pick up a game on Cleveland make it a little more interesting. Just last year that the Twins were in the middle of that and it was so much fun this time of the year sure last was. year to watch the scoreboard and after four losing years in a row the Twins were in it up until the last weekend. And that's one of the 
shames of this season. The first three months were so awful that there was never a reason to watch the scoreboard in terms of where the Twins uh, would be in relation to other teams. My ball to left, caught by Upton, one away. Join us on Monday, September 5th, against the Royals for Eduardo Escobar and friends. Labor Day celebration benefiting Venezuelan youth. Special ticket package includes tickets on the Budweiser roof deck, a post-game meet and greet with Eduardo Escobar and other Twins players and more. You can learn more at twinsbaseball.com slash Escobar or call 833-TWINS. Down on the eighth, and here is Dozier. Homered into the bullpen his last time up. He was the last Twins batter to reach safely. And I think you can see whether you have high def or not. The rain's coming down pretty hard again. For those of you who are with us Friday night from Kansas City, you'd be happy to know that manager Paul Molitor concurred with me that he's never seen a game resumed in the weather conditions in which we resumed the game Friday night. It was raining really hard when they decided to start playing. I thought it was uh, just my opinion, but he agreed. And of course, it, he was. Uh, in a tie game, wanted to continue to play the game. Nobody wants double headers this time of the year. And so he was okay with the rain delay of more than three hours, but was really amazed that the game was resumed under the conditions in which it was. Yeah, especially after three hours of sitting there waiting for it to go away. The rain on Friday night, I think it's fair to say, it was raining harder when play resumed than it was when play was stopped, which you don't see very often. Two and two to Dozier. Enough talk about rain. We're trying to ignore what's coming down now. Wrap to third. Nice pickup by McGee, and he throws him out two down. Big league play right there. And that'll bring up Jorge Polanco. It is August 23rd, and I think what the Twins fans want to see, and I know Paul Molitor wants to see it, they're going to be playing a lot of teams. Where the opposition has something to play for in October that the Twins don't. And you don't want long losing streaks as the Twins have now experienced against teams like Kansas City and Detroit. Next up, Toronto. Next up, Cleveland. You want to continue the competitiveness that you've shown over the last six, seven weeks. Here's a pop up short left, and Upton dodging raindrops makes the catch. And it's a quick eight for Wilson. But to the extent it's blown open now in the middle innings. A couple of three run innings chasing Kyle Gibson, then tacking up three more in the seventh against Michael Tonka. Left hander Pat Dean will pitch to the Tigers in the ninth. 11th game for Pat. He's been up and down. Uh, 
Did a good job for a while, then was sent back to Rochester, now back up again. And he'll take over the ninth inning here. Try to keep the Tigers in check. Face Cabrera, Martinez, and Martinez, Victor, and JD. We had an interesting conversation last Sunday talking to Paul Molitor on the manager show about September 1st and uh, expanding the roster. Who might they be considering? I I threw out there. You got a lot of young players that you're trying to find playing time right now. You know, do you take that in consideration when you're talking about expanding the roster? And he said, you know, we certainly want to award or reward those guys deserving of getting a call up. But we're cognizant of the fact of how much playing time they're actually going to get. Right. And uh, give me the indication that there may not be as many as normal because a lot of these guys have been up and down so many times this right. summer anyway. They've already had a good look at it. I'll be particularly interested in there will be a catcher at it, probably just one. And which catcher will it be? Yeah. Will it be John Ryan Murphy, who was supposed to be here all year long? Mitch Garver since he's been promoted to triple A has done really well and he's probably the top catching prospect uh, among drafted and developed guys that the twins have in their system and they may want to take a peek at him in September promoted from double A to triple A this year and you know, what three four more hits again tonight one and one to Cabrera and a ball rounded sharply up the middle a base hit to start the night that guy can hit a little bit too. But within the at bats of Miguel Cabrera and Victor Martinez, the next guy, you hope the people in the Twins dugout are paying attention. Look at this pitch and what he tried to do with it. He had no intention of trying to pull that ball. Middle of the field is open and yep. he hit it hard up and, the middle. And you could just see by that swing that in how his head aligned with the ball that he was trying to shoot the ball right back at the pitch. Right. And now here is Victor Martinez. He has two hits and even an infield hit, and we were there to watch it. And then he hit a long home run to right. <laughs> that infield hit took three years away from his life. <laughs> <laughs> he was worn out when he got to first base. You know what? You have to respect somebody who you can tell just when he has to run it, it hurts. Could be a double play grounder. Polanco, nice flip. And there's a double play to now. And I don't know, you know, I'm sure you had a lot of pain in your arm at times when you pitched, but boy, you're asked to perform at a very high level. And even trotting off the field, I can promise you, Victor Martinez is in some pain. Yeah, this game's hard enough when you're healthy. But when you're going through that you've, you've got to have the mental fortitude of blocking it out and it's hard to do two down and now J.D. Martinez two singles for Martinez a big swing and a miss Two lead after five. And then the Tigers got three in the sixth, three in the seventh. Kyle Ryan getting loose in the Tiger bullpen. One and two. And Kepler in the bottom of the ninth. On the ground, sharply to Blue. Dean with a good inning. He faces just three men in the top of the ninth.
few good moments for the Twins fans who are here tonight, but for the most part, it's been a night for Detroit as they lead it eight to three. Rally caps are out, getting soggier with every minute with the rain continuing to come down. And Ryan will come out of the Tiger bullpen to face the three, four, and five batters. Alexander Kyle Ryan, I remember the first time he came into a game for Detroit, I was working over there. And he looked just like Clint Eastwood. Really? Now you can't tell that now that he's growing the old beard out. It's more like. Uh, now that's Duck okay Dynasty if you're talking, guys. you know, like 60s, 70s, Clint. But young Clint Eastwood. Young Clint. Okay. All right, good. Hard to see through all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. And that's to left field. It's hanging in the air for Upton. He makes the catch one away. We'll bring up Blue. All right, what's next? Brought to you by Century Link. We are televising tomorrow. We are not televising Thursday, however. Left hander Matt Boyd will go for Detroit. Tyler Duffy going for the Tigers. And Boyd's been pretty good as of late for the Tigers. Well, he's the guy that, one of the two guys that the Tigers got in the trade for with Toronto. David Price David trade. David Price yeah. trade, yeah. And uh, he's kind of coming into his own. Left hander that's got a good arm. Just missing down and in. It'll go down as another ball game here tonight. Unless the Twins come back here with one down, it'll go down as another game where the Twins didn't pitch very well. Tonkin had a rough outing. Kyle Gibson struggled throwing strikes to the bottom of the Tiger order. Two and zero to Pluth. Going to two and eight against the Tigers this year. Blue chagrin by strike two. Interesting that conversation I talked about earlier with Paul Molitor last Sunday on the manager show. I asked. I also referred to the. Common knowledge of most baseball fans knowing that pitching wins, and without it, you have a tough time. Chopper to third, McGee gobbles it up, two down. And I asked Paul, I said, you know, how concerning is it for you and the pitching staff? And he said, it's my the one aspect of the game I'm most concerned about going into next year. And he said, we certainly are evaluating everybody like we should, but. Uh, It'll be an interesting offseason to see how we put it all together going into next spring. Well, and that's what uh, I think is the biggest disappointment about tonight. Kyle Gibson coming off a, a good outing, not a great outing because of who it was against. Well, the ball rolled to short, will probably end the game. Gibson really struggled here tonight. That's been the disappointing thing for Kyle Gibson and getting him in position where you know what to expect on a nightly basis. Well, that's just it. We've been looking for the consistency. Another. So so game he ends up losing it to gives up the five runs on five hits. And Tom the twin struggles against in the, everyone in the division except Cleveland continue and now against Kansas City and Detroit the twins have lost five straight. Dick the twins beat the rain but they couldn't beat the Tigers tonight coming up next on twins live presented by Century Link we'll talk about what the Tigers did at the plate. Speed at the top of the Twins lineup made a difference early on. We'll hear from Paul Molitor in preview game two tomorrow night.